Good morning. My name is Austin Hassemuller, and I'm a graduate of the SMS class of 2012. I'm excited to introduce you to my former classmate, Kira Duffley, to you today. Excuse me, I said that wrong. Kira Rice Duffley graduated from St. Mary's in 2012 and went on to the University of Mississippi, where she received her BA in Art History in 2016. Immediately following her college graduation, Kira was chosen to manage the art mecca of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina, where she represented over 60 emerging local artists. After she and her husband, Jake Duffley, were married in November 2017, they moved to Newport News, Virginia on Jake's military orders, where the couple still lives with their dog, Byrne. Once they settled in Virginia, Kira dove headfirst into finding ways to get connected with local art and humanities institutions. She volunteered as a docent at the Peninsula Fine Arts Center and then briefly held a position as gallery assistant at the Charles Taylor Visual Arts Center before accepting a full-time position with the Mariners Museum and Park. In 2020, her third year at the museum, she helped to found the production team and now serves as the multimedia specialist with a focus on videography and video editing. Kira is also the creator and host of the Mariners' first ever video series, Beyond the Frame, which takes an interpretive and inclusive look at the museum's vast painting collection. Kira believes that art is for everyone and seeks to share that message with guests in the galleries and across the world through online platforms. She is grateful to her encouraging St. Mary's teachers, specifically Nancy Prilliman, for fostering her love of art history built upon the foundation her mother, Melanie Rice Fisher, or Fisher Rice, the class of 1979, instilled in her throughout her life. Kira is the step-granddaughter of Valerie Fisher, class of 1974, and attended St. Mary's alongside her older sister, Mary Lana Rice, class of 2009, and younger sister, Miranda Rice, class of 2015. In addition to art and videography, Kira is also an avid gardener, art collector, United Way Emerging Leaders Steering Committee member, and she loves yoga, reading, and cooking. Please join me in welcoming Kira Rice Duffley. Up the stairs, I follow her. Through a workroom lined with racks and shelves, I know they're filled with artifacts from around the world and throughout time, but that's not what we're here for. She finds her way through a dark room, and with a loud click, she flips the switch. The lights sputter on. It takes a moment for me to get a grasp on this space. Green metal racks, floor to ceiling, line the room. I take a slow step forward, then another, peeking down the narrow aisles between the racks, they're totally full, lined with paintings. So many paintings. Portraits, battles, ships, sea, and landscapes. So many stories yet to be told. I turn around and face her. Are you crying? She says, a little confused. I hadn't realized it until then, but she was right. What I didn't know then was that this moment would alter my course, my life, and career immeasurably. My love of art began when I was little, but my fascination with art history started right here at St. Mary's. In Miss Umphress's seventh grade history class, we were studying the French Revolution, and she put up Eugene Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People and Jericho's Raft of the Medusa. We studied the composition, the drama, and how the action in the paintings related to history. I felt like something clicked. Later, in upper school, I studied art history with Miss Prilliman, and in her class, I felt like I came alive. And I'll be honest, I was not a great student. In fact, there are teachers sitting out there who are probably just as shocked that I am that I'm here speaking to you today. <laughs> it's not something that I'm proud of. But art, art made things make sense. It was like a pushpin on a timeline that helped untangle the jungle in my mind. And it, my teachers here at St. Mary's fostered that. Ms. Prelliman would take us down to the gallery in Buckman, and we would look at the works, and she would ask us if we liked it. And whether we said yes or no, she would prompt us for more. She wanted to know our why. Why we liked or disliked something. Was it the color, the line, the composition, the subject? And this helped me to narrow down specifics, lean more into a work regardless of whether I liked it or not. And that exercise stuck with me. 
I studied abroad in London while I was in college, and during that time, I took three art history courses. I spent many of my days in the galleries and museums challenging myself with that same set of questions. Do I like this, and why, or why not? And if I decided I didn't like a work, I would sit with it, sometimes for hours, taking notes on everything I saw until I found something that I liked, that I respected or appreciated. And that time, the time spent with works of art became sacred to me. They became less like objects and more like friends, like people I have yet to meet, but all of whom have stories to tell. I did a lot, of the, uh, I did a lot in the years between then and now, but when my husband was stationed in Virginia and we moved there, I sought out museums, and it expanded my world more than I could ever know. Today at the Mariners Museum and Park, America's National Maritime Museum, I'm the multimedia production specialist. But four and a half years and five job titles ago, I started selling admission tickets at the front desk for the summer, then quickly moved into the sales department. But I was at a maritime museum. I didn't really even know what that meant, but I did know that I was not a big boat person. <laughs> I struggled at first to see what I might be able to appreciate about the Mariner's collection, and then I remembered that exercise. I sat with the objects and I looked for the why, learned their stories and came to see them too as friends and realized that there was something for everyone there, not just boat people. But I have to admit, despite my growing respect for maritime history and the connection that was budding there, I was a little disappointed. I had walked through the museum for over a year and throughout the entire expansive museum and it's a big museum, I saw less than a dozen works of original art. This confused me, but then later one of our collections management staff told me about the conditions needed to properly display oil paintings. And then came a question that was a catalyst for a change in my life that I never saw coming. A very simple, would you like to see painting storage? Did you know that most museums have only between two and four percent of their collections on display? That means that at any given time, there could be hundreds, thousands, or millions of objects or artifacts in storage within the walls of a museum. I wasn't sure what to expect as the light flicked on and I looked around me, but I never imagined this. Where there were roughly 12 paintings in the galleries, there were 1,200 oil paintings alone in painting storage. Racks and racks of paintings from the 1600s till today. And it was amazing. And I knew practically nothing about maritime art except for my preconceived notion that it was all ship portraits. Little did I know that idea would be blown out of the water in less than six months. But all I knew is that I needed to find a way to talk about these works. They seemed to pull and tug at my mind, but there were so many that I didn't know where to start. And then I realized I didn't even know how to start. I had never studied in an institution like this or done scholarly research outside of projects for school or college. I was on the sales team and hardly anyone even knew that I studied art history. I was unskilled, unqualified, but I was curious. So I worked with our collections team to learn about some of the paintings and it was hard at first because even within an institution of learning like a museum, people thought, well, she's on the sales team. What can she know? My degree in art history earned me a little bit more grace, but I felt like an imposter. So I learned how to research, and I studied, and I learned, and I was able to work with our collections team to set up paintings from storage in the galleries, to tell their stories, and help our guests learn, too. And then COVID. But amidst the darkness of that time, the museum team knew that we had to keep connecting people, keep sharing our mission. We connect people to the world's waters because through the waters, through our shared maritime heritage, we are connected to one another. This is something that has, been kept, that has kept me driving through the past few years. And in pondering that idea of connection, I realized that that was, I think, what my relationship with art had been about all along. The reason I loved it so deeply. Because our experience with a work of art depends on our openness and vulnerability, our willingness to open our hearts and minds and ask that question, why do I like this? What in it speaks to me? Or perhaps what about this work scares or bothers me? What connection do I have to this piece? 
That idea of connection led me to pitch a video series that would present the art in our collection in a very different way. To remove that intellectual barrier to entry that had told me that I had to be qualified to look at a work of art in order to properly appreciate or understand it. One that would, if done right, connect people with works of art in an open, vulnerable, and entertaining way. And that was crazy. We didn't have a video team. We didn't have dedicated researchers or art historians to talk about these works. And who was I? Some idealistic girl on the sales team who likes art and has no video experience, a background in art history, sure, but no advanced degrees and no scholarly research and writing experience. And I was so scared because just talking about what I wanted to do went against the current status of what most museums do and how they share the stories of objects. And I got a lot of opinions, some helpful and productive, but many more negative, ones that reinforce that feeling of inadequacy, that what on earth am I doing? But something in me said that this was important, that despite my fear, I needed to ask and find the why in these works and learn and share their stories. So I picked a painting and I wrote a script. I found a few people at the museum who liked it and supported the vision. And with the approval of our leadership, we started testing the first episode of the Mariner's first ever video series called Beyond the Frame. It's been a wild, emotional, exhausting, and wonderful journey. I've learned videography and video editing, how to make the vision in my head come to life through a camera and on screen. And that's another aspect of this massive, unexpected change that has left me seeking more. I learned about researching, writing, and storytelling. I sought to push myself and get better and better. And Beyond the Frame laid the groundwork for my manager and I to start the museum's first ever production team. Two years, 21 episodes, so many new connections made and stories discovered, and well over one and a quarter million views later, Beyond the Frame has grown to something I never could have imagined, something better than I ever could have hoped for. It has changed and shaped my life through creativity, challenges, storytelling, and connection. But I'm still learning, still growing, still trying to tell myself that the work that I do is good. It helps propel a mission that is based in connection, just like the connection I found with art. I don't fit in a neat little box. And yes, I still feel like an imposter, like I'm not qualified enough, and it can be a challenge. But I am an art historian. I am a writer. I am a videographer. I am a video editor. I am a storyteller. I am all of these things and none of them. But most of all, I am proud of the work that I do. And I'm grateful that it started here. Uh, for those of you who might be interested in uh, seeing some videos, uh, some of the episodes of Beyond the Frame, please join me and Ms. Perlman in the Distance Learning Lab after chapel, where we'll have some showing. Thank you.